Well, thank you everybody for joining us for this session on Voices of Healthcare Workers During COVID. I'm joined today by six uh, really interesting guests from around the world that are going to share with you their experiences of COVID over the past year and, and try and capture a, a cross-section of different voices and experiences from healthcare workers around the world. I'm Mike Christian. Uh, I'm an intensive care physician with a background in infectious disease and public health uh, coming to you from London, England, but uh, previously from Canada, uh, where I started my career largely in SARS and then uh, have been in this field and working in emergency preparedness and disaster management for the past uh, 15 plus years. Joining me today, uh, we have Matt Walton, who is a junior doctor here in London, England as well, who was working in the A&E and intensive care in one of the uh, hardest hit ICUs or hospitals. Uh, during the first wave of COVID. Also coming from Australia, we have Samantha Bates, who is a nurse by background, currently a critical care research manager with 24 years of experience in, in nursing and healthcare, and uh, will be presenting the uh, perspective from down under, joining us bright and early in the morning. So thanks so much, Samantha, for coming up, getting up so early. Uh, coming to us from South Africa, we have uh, Marvin Murr, who's a professor of and clinical head of intensive care medicine. Uh, there in South Africa. Also, we have uh, Benedetta, uh, who's joining us from Geneva, Switzerland, who is a professor of infectious diseases. She's trained all around the world and worked all over the world in various uh, different outbreaks and is currently with the WHO in Geneva. And then we also have uh, Ditesh, who's from Nepal. He uh, trained previously in Toronto, my hometown, but now works in Nepal as the ICU coordinator and uh, has been involved in research internationally uh, during this uh, COVID outbreak. And finally, coming from Uganda, we have Cornelius, who is an anesthetist and intensivist uh, and is uh, um, presenting today, who may have some, uh, uh, some connectivity issues, so uh, he may or may not be on video during parts of the conversation. So thanks to all of my guests for joining. We're going to begin this session by giving each of them a few moments just to um, present their background and uh, experience over the past year uh, during the uh, uh, during the pandemic. I encourage you to uh, include your comments in the chat. I'll do my best to capture them. Uh, after all, the speakers have had a few minutes to uh, to give their opening and uh, comments. We'll then go into a round robin discussion and try and address as many of your questions as possible. So, Matt, if you want to kick us off and uh, take the floor, uh, please tell us about your uh, your past year of uh, COVID in London. Thank you very much, Mike. And I echo what you said about the incredible lineup of, of co-presenters that we've got today. I'm, for one, very excited to hear everyone else but me speak, uh, but I will take five minutes of your time to give a bit of background on myself. So I'm an emergency physician working in London, England, in the United Kingdom, and I've been qualified for only three years, so I'm relatively junior. I worked in one of the biggest emergency departments in London throughout the COVID pandemic, and notably uh, one which was especially badly hit during the first wave uh, around March and April in 2020. Over a two-month period, we uh, had around 400 patients admitted to our intensive care, uh, which is less than 20 beds normally and had an intubation rate of over 10 people per day at around the peak. We had uh, several staff members die uh, tragically in our hospital and um, we had uh, obviously the intensive care unit overwhelmed and had a rapid re-expansion uh, during uh, the two month period. To give some context on the United Kingdom, uh, from what I uh, can understand, we have the second lowest number of ventilated beds uh, per capita in Europe. Um, and we have, unfortunately, at the moment, one of the highest uh, death rates per capita from COVID-19 on uh, as official recordings go, uh, which is higher than the USA or Brazil at the moment and is, is 12th in, in the world. I thought I'd sum up my experience uh, as one individual working uh, th through the COVID pandemic on a few milestones and significant issues that we faced uh, along our journey. So. Firstly, I think we had the anticipation, almost excitement at some points, but then certainly fear when we realised what was about to hit us. And we were looking 
at other countries, China, Wuhan, and uh, the region of Lombardy and Italy, where I'm sure uh, Benedetta was doing a lot, a lot of work at the time, looking at how it was overwhelming a country very similar to ourselves and us foreseeing what would be happening very shortly after and thinking, you know, were we prepared adequately for that to, to happen? And following that, we had a rapid and exponential growth of COVID-19 uh, cases, which was sort of the caseload was doubling sort of every three to four days to the point where our hospital was filled, our intensive care was filled, and we were treating patients for the first time in the backs of ambulances, which were stacked tens of ambulances high. Some ambulances bringing two patients at once, which is unlike anything we normally face in the United Kingdom. Uh, it was psychologically challenging for me, especially as a junior clinician, because I was, I suppose, exposed to a uh, massively, uh, critically unwell cohort of patients that normally, you know, I would see a few times in a month, whereas we were seeing them every case, every single day. Uh, we were seeing lots of younger and younger patients coming in unwell and, and dying from COVID without their family members present often. And we were having to escalate decisions in terms of ceilings of care of treatment and do not resuscitate uh, orders which we have in the United Kingdom and making those decisions a lot earlier, often kind of in the emergency department and even starting to consider them while patients are still in the backs of the ambulances. And then seeing how very vulnerable members of our society in the United Kingdom, you know, in London, having people living uh, 11 people you know in one or two bedrooms in the house and kind of seeing how it, the virus will exploit that kind of uh, unevenness in the society uh, and then from the emergency department we had uh, uh, the rapid intensive care expansion and due to staff shortages we had 30 percent of our staff uh, sick with covid uh, I was redeployed to the intensive care unit. So I had the experience of my colleagues, Cornelius, Samantha, Dipesh and, and Mervyn of working, you know, in that PPE for 12 hours a day. Um, we, our rotor was 50% night shifts, 50% day shifts and a 50 hour week. And I had the terrible privilege of looking after my own colleagues and their families who were, who were unwell and admitted into intensive care. Uh, and we were transferring out 40% of our patients to our neighboring hospitals. Uh, and, and the intensive care, you know, double, triple, quadrupled in size, filling up wards, operating theatres and, and sourcing ventilators from uh, the anaesthetic rooms, for example. Uh, one of the significant issues we faced, um, despite being normally a very well resourced country, was personal protective equipment uh, for for me, this uh, this would be uh, kind of wearing what I perceive to be a, a reduced standard of personal protective equipment. So at the start, the standard that was required in the United Kingdom was similar to what you would see an Ebola patient with, with a full hood, uh, the, the, the visors, the, the boots and everything. But for my first patient, I was already using clinical waste bags on, on my feet because of the shortages of, of equipment. And then the requirements were downgraded. So it was viewed as a high consequence of infectious disease like SARS or Ebola, but then it was decided that we would the next day be seeing patients in a surgical mask and an apron, which was quite a big psychological step to make. And then despite this, uh, we, we still had inadequate supplies and we were not able to be all provided with the adequately fit, fitted FFP3 masks necessary to protect from aerosolizing procedures. And... Um, mul and multiple of uh, you know the staff, as I'm sure is the same case around the world, showed remarkable bravery of, of entering clinical environments where they were knowingly unprotected and hugely self-sacrificing and, and brave acts on behalf of their patients, which which was uh, phenomenal to witness. And then, of course, we had uh, some staff deaths, one of whom I worked with, uh, which is incredibly tragic, incredibly difficult as a human being and as a team to deal with and something that I think I have learned a lot from uh, the experience um, that, that maybe we can think about in, in later in the conversations uh, and then also in terms of learning I've had the uh, opportunity to collaborate with Mike Christian the chair of this meeting where we co-authored an academic paper on finding out ways to support the mental health of 
are uh, healthcare workers and, and how we can uh, provide strategies for organizations, leaders of teams and individuals to pragmatically support healthcare workers who are dealing with such crisis in the, in the pandemic. Uh, and of course, I took positives away from this, like what a privilege it is to work with amazing colleagues and the privilege of feeling, you know, pricelessly valuable and caring for patients in their time of need. And so anyway, I, I think that's my time up. So I will stop speaking, but I am fascinated to hear from everyone else. And I can't wait to hear your experiences. Uh, thanks, Matt. So much to dive into there later with all the impacts and particularly your comments about the psychological impacts. Uh, moving on now to Samantha from Down Under. Thank you so much for the introduction, Mike. And um, gosh, um, Matt, you've sort of set up a very humbling scene and I uh, I almost feel um, embarrassed giving a small um, snippet of, uh, of our experience in Australia. Uh, okay, so apologies to those that are listening out um, in the world um, if you couldn't hear me. So I'll... Um, just introduce myself again. I'm, I'm a research nurse in intensive care in Melbourne um, and uh, I was just quite humbled listening to um, even Matt's experiences um, from the, the UK experience of, of what they experienced with COVID. I, I believe we're very humbled in Australia that we've had nothing like what we're seeing on a catastrophic level with, with patients um, presenting with COVID and, and elsewhere around the world. But uh, in particular, there was a real fear um, that we were going to not have any uh, adequate PPE to protect healthcare workers um, uh, and, and face severe shortages of PPE and protective gear for, for staff in particular. So uh, although I am an intensive care nurse by background, I've actually been a research nurse um, for about the last 10 years, specialising in critical care research, and I've worked on a number of sepsis trials um, in the past, uh, but we ended up developing uh, a device to help protect our healthcare workers, um, and we uh, found ourselves in a very different space of, of looking at some trial um, and innovative device design. So, um, what uh, one of my um, and these were some of the images that we were seeing from around the world um, in an effort uh, to contain uh, the spread of virus. Um, there were. Um, certainly images coming out of Italy with patients on CPAP bubble helmets um, and there were some rather crude attempts at, um, I suppose, trying to contain virus spread from, from infected patients as well. One of my colleagues, um, Associate Professor Forbes McGain, he's an intensivist and anaesthetist um, at Western Health where I work uh, and conceptualised the idea of containing um, patients within a, a ventilation hood and collaborated with some mechanical engineers at the University of Melbourne to design something um, to go over the top of the bed um, of a patient. And we sought some input from uh, nurses, doctors and, and ex-ICU patients in the development of this design. Um, and we wanted to trial this, um, and that's where my skill set came in, to rapidly draft out uh, a protocol and regulatory paperwork to present to an, uh, an ethics review board who were ratifying COVID-19 projects at the time. Um, and uh, we set about trialling this in our intensive care units. But the design brief of the ventilation hood itself uh, was really simple in concept and design. It wanted to provide a physical barrier from droplets. It had a negative pressure extraction fan to stop aerosol spread, um, a, a high efficiency particulate filter or a H13 HEPA filter uh, to contain virus particles. We wanted it to be retractable, mobile, and allow emergency access to the patient. It needed to be relatively cheap um, and sourced from locally sourced products. Uh, so, in fact, the, the negative pressure extraction hood fan is your, your general kitchen extraction fan or your bathroom extraction fan. Um, and we wanted it to be fairly um, environmentally sustainable, so to have uh, reusable components as much as possible. But the application for this we were conceptualising has um, benefits beyond even COVID. So, uh, for instance, other um, uh, respiratory infectious diseases such as tuberculosis, measles and influenza in particular. Um, this next slide just demonstrates some of the control measures that you can take to help protect your healthcare workers. Uh, if you consider that a normal hospital room with, with usual ventilation systems has about six air changeover cycles per, uh, per hour, 
Uh, a negative pressure room will have about 12 air cycle changeover per hour. And in our negative pressure ventilation hood, we're able to achieve 100 air changeover cycles per hour. Um, and using the HEPA filter is a very effective method of uh, containing spread. So uh, we sought feedback questionnaires um, and um, design um, uh, surveillance from our staff and also from our patients that were um, awake and able to use the device. And we found that it was well tolerated by both staff and patients who could work around the, um, the hood quite easily. And it enabled us to use um, uh, aerosol generating therapies such as non-invasive ventilation, CPAP, BiPAP, high flow, um, and we could even extubate intubated patients underneath this hood. So for us in trying to combat the shortage of negative pressure rooms, um, this quickly became adopted as our standard piece of equipment. And at the height of the pandemic, uh, we had um, pretty much every patient in our intensive care units under one of these ventilation hoods. The attack rate for staff was extremely low. We only had three nurses um, that contracted COVID-19 and three doctors um, that also were, were positive for COVID-19. So we generally feel that this was a really positive move to help protect our healthcare workers and it was embraced wholeheartedly. Uh, in particular, um, uh, my involvement was with um, looking at the sustainability and reusable options. We trialled many different types of grades of PVC for the plastic cover, and we had significant engagement with my infectious diseases consultants and infection prevention team about cleaning um, these devices. In particular, we were looking at um, something like this being used for other uh, hospitals um, around the world um, you know, as a potential device to help them combat shortages of equipment and controls. Um, and so we ended up uh, trialling a lot of manual washable processes, which I ended up coming in after hours late at night on weekends um, because it was a dire need to keep using these devices as more patients were coming through. So we've now refined it to a washable process where we simply peel off the, the plastic cover. We can put them in a washing machine um, at a 60 to 65 degree wash with a detergent agent for a minimum of 20 minutes. And it cleans and disinfects not only um, SARS-CoV-2 virus, but of course, uh, VRE, CPE, MRSA, any other bugs that you can think of. Um, and we're also uh, now investing in uh, using our central sterilising services to also clean and disinfect the, the covers. Um, and the frames, of course, get manually wiped down um, in between patients as well. So in terms of the significant impact this had on our um, healthcare worker staff, um, Look, we had uh, nurses that were thanking me profusely for the efforts that we went to in trying to help protect them. Uh, they felt much safer. Uh, we couldn't have rolled this out at a better time because it was just before our second wave. I even had nurses that were coming back early from their maternity leave because they felt safer returning to an environment where we could better protect our healthcare staff. Um, so they were... Uh, uh, palpably frightened, I think would be the word to describe um, where staff were at the start of the, the pandemic, but introducing these devices certainly helped lift the morale and mood for our staff considerably. Um, uh, I have absolutely no financial interest in this product at all, and I will disclose that up front, but I have just put some information there on a slide if any Anybody listening out there is um, wanting some more information about that. We've now shipped and transported these um, to countries such as Papua New Guinea at the moment, which are experiencing a, a severe wave um, of, of COVID. Uh, Thursday Island, Nauru, um, we've shipped some units to Exeter in the UK uh, around um, early January when they're experiencing some dire numbers of COVID patients as well. Um, and I, we'd love to see these being um, perhaps picked up or used by, by other hospitals um, around the world if it's going to be a benefit in helping protect healthcare workers. So that's my journey, something a little different. I've been extremely tired throughout that entire process, but there was a, an urgency and a need to help protect our staff. Uh, and although I was pressured um, to be redeployed back clinically at bedside, I found a real um, torn sense of commitment as to where my best responsibilities lay in being redeployed bedside as an intensive care nurse for, for bedside shifts or to continue on with our really important research work. And I'm very grateful that we were able to to keep me supported um, in, the, in the research perspective to help develop this product. 
So there you go, something a little bit different, a little bit interesting from my perspective um, and I hope you found that interesting uh, and happy to receive some, some comments and chats about that. Over to you, Mike. Oh, thanks so much, Samantha. And first off, let me apologise on behalf of the conference for the uh, uh, audiovisual difficulties, both uh, to yourself and to the uh, the audience. I know it's, it's frustrating for everybody and difficult to give a, a talk um, when you're having AV issues. So thanks for um, continuing to plow through and uh, uh, we'll continue right on now. Um, next, we'll move on to, uh, to Mervyn and uh, keep your questions coming in and I'll uh, get to those when we get to the round robin. So over to you, Mervyn. Thank you very much, Mike. And uh, thanks very much to Matthew and Samantha for those fascinating insights. And before I begin, I just want to pay personal homage and tribute to, to all the courageous champions, healthcare workers around the globe uh, just remarkable colleagues and friends uh, that that we have. I'm going to take a slightly different spin on things and try and, in fact, demonstrate what feasibly can be done under the most arduous circumstances. And just to put that into perspective, I work in a low middle income class country in many era areas, enormously resource limited. 55% of South Africans live on under the equivalent of two US dollars per day. We have large numbers of people who live in single dwellings, uh, in informal dwellings, and we don't really have a very structured way of public transportation. So 16 million South Africans travel in minibus taxis every single day to work sitting on top of each other. And so when we have a look at that sort of scenario, um, it really posed pretty significant problems. Uh, with that sort of background when we realize what feasibly we may be facing. I put down a couple of points um, here that I'd like to run through. There are 10 points and at the end of the discussion we'll conclude. But people have asked me what has the last 13 months in our setting been like? And if I had to use terminology, I'd use the following terms. Taxing and tantalizing, eerie and enthusing, and in fact, enormously educated, intrusive and illuminating, demanding and distinctive, but importantly rewarding and a time for reflection. And I think multiple lessons have been learned from the COVID-19 issue that certainly in a low middle income class country, we can try and share. And for me, the following elements were really relevant, preparation, so we followed on elsewhere in the world. And as soon as we, in fact, heard what was going on in China, we realized that this may become a global phenomenon. And so we'd had a little bit of the gift of time. But early on, we got a representative body together in my own hospital, which was a designated referral hospital, without a single dedicated full-time intensive care post, not one in my hospital, yet we were the referral center. And we got all these role players together. And after our first meeting, we in fact had a protocol, which was later refined and widely adopted. The next important issue for me was communication. We were facing enormous fear, panic, and anxiety amongst the whole spectrum of healthcare workers. And so what I thought may be very useful was that we introduced a bi-daily staff interaction. I prefer that term rather than a debrief where we allowed people in an open fashion uh, to address their fears, their anxieties, uh, to share their thoughts. And this helped enormously because we were able to address issues. Uh, and as a consequence, we were able to implement decisions that needed to be taken in a much easier fashion. And we at the outset, we had people who actually said, we are not going to get involved in this. We eventually were having volunteers and we were having people who were doing their work with passion and purpose. And we extended this to families as well. Staff protection has been alluded to, and we faced really enormous problems with lack of PPE. We went through all the guidelines and we deemed and put together what we felt was suitable uh, for protection of our staff. Prior to this, we had many healthcare workers infected and we were having to look after some of our own colleagues in a very traumatizing scenario. Once we put together what we felt was appropriate, looking at guidelines, um, we initiated our own training until in fact people were 
unbelievably confident with things. And following that, we had very little or no further infections. Challenges bring opportunity. And in my mind, when we were asked early on, should we be putting up field hospitals as we'd seen all over the world? And my impression was we should be expanding our existing facilities in resource limited settings for a number of reasons. Number one, to accommodate patients with COVID-19. But number two, we would be able post COVID-19 to retain those facilities and potentially offer a service to thousands of people, of, of individuals, patients down the line with benefit for years to come. And so I engaged with some social responsibility partners and within six weeks, we had more than doubled, in fact, trebled our capacity. We started a nursing upskill program. We took nurses from old aged homes and elsewhere uh, who were then looking after ICU patients. With our social re responsibility interaction, we acquired ventilators. We, we helped develop and initiate a CPAP device that could be plugged in to the wall. And in fact, this revolutionized outcomes of patients and we salvaged many, many patients. Simplicity for me is absolutely paramount to the way we should be practicing in any healthcare scenario. If you do the simple things well, you're likely to have a favorable outcome. And being poor does not mean poor care. In fact, sound practice with excellent quality of care is feasible and possible. And excellence can be achieved even in the face of adversity. One of the things that we were told up front was to do more with less. We were actually told that. And I went back to them and said, that's all very well, provided we don't do less for more. And that's one of the biggest lessons that we've learned. Initially, we were stretching nursing staff to look after one to three, one to four, one to five. We were nursing as well after hours. And with a very small complement of people, in fact, we were there every single day. In fact, this past weekend was my first weekend off in 13 months. Worked every single day and every single night uh, for the past 13 months. We were also able, with the simplicity background, to have what I refer to as creativity and innovation in terms of therapy and ethics. And if there's time, I'm happy to allude to some of those issues down the line. But very briefly, we started right from the outset using corticosteroids based on some wonderful resource-limited work with varicella pneumonia. And we knew that that was likely to impact. And all our colleagues around country were saying that our results are different to yours. And um, when you have a look at the recovery trial, the, the steroids that we were using about three months before the rest of the globe was exactly the same dose. This proning issue, we thought about it carefully and pragmatically because we have to rely on clinical acumen. We don't have all the other entities available. And very soon it came to, to mind, why are we wanting to turn patients over when they're already struggling? Get them to sit in a chair, get them to stand up. That's the best way, gravitationally, to expand your, your lungs and get gas exchange. And worked exceedingly well, even with rebreathing polymasks. We opened the windows. We don't have any negative pressure facilities. And in fact, shared that very early on. You get great air exchanges, 6, 12, and even greater per hour, which is better than many negative pressure facilities or extraction uh, facilities. And we introduced things like surgical masks over the interfaces for the two or three high flow nasal oxygen machines that in fact we did have, and we were not concerned um, with um, aerosolization as a consequence and no one got infected. And then we introduced our own triage system based on a very simplistic issue, uh, which I can share later on. We remained flexible. We engaged, we learned, we went through everything. And as all of us learned, we in fact changed issues and together with the flexibility and simplicity, this impacted enormously favorably uh, in terms of outcome, uh, which we're going through currently. And some of the outcomes appear to be better than, in, than those reported in many uh, well-respected centers. I've got down profession, and I think this is enormously relevant because people, uh, we, we've read about people being burnt out. We've read about people having to work under the most strenuous and arduous 
circumstances. But what we tried to impart was that it was a privilege to be in this profession. And it wasn't just the COVID-19 patients. It was those patients who still had to be looked after who, were, who did not have COVID-19. And that made getting up every single day very, very easy. Critical care is really relevant. And I think what COVID-19 has done is bring to the fore the relevance of critical care, irrespective of where we in fact practice. In my own setting, with the expansion project that we undertook and the nursing upskill programs, in my own setting, we've advanced critical care 10 to 20 years. And if one had to say, how could you put that in words? Because we did this literally with, with a very limited number of people. So many have benefited from just a few who have given so much. And so I just want to pay, again, kudos and acknowledgement to all those courageous champions. When we talk about critical care, I like to turn the terminology around. It's critical to care. And one of the wonderful South African philosophies and African philosophies is a term that we refer to as Ubuntu, which means that we should practice the care that we give in a humane fashion and with compassion. And that means similarly the way that we treat our fellow staff and across the board healthcare workers, security people, kitchen people, ambulance personnel, and everyone involved in the scenario. And so for me, it is possible to make that difference, even in the face of adversity. And one of the big issues that's often bandied about uh, by people is that, you know, this just seems impossible. Others use the term that nothing is impossible. I like to turn that term around as well. Because if you really are passionate about things and you have a will and a want, in fact, impossible is nothing. And so I'm going to leave things at this point. Uh, as I say, I wanted to give a positive spin because I think there are many hugely advantageous issues that have emanated in and amongst some of the trauma that we've had to face. And when we have a chance at the end of this session, I will wrap up um, with uh, one or two words that I'd like to share with the broader audience. So thank you very, very much for this opportunity. Uh, I'm most graciously um, grateful for the opportunity to be invited and to share a couple of perspectives and thoughts on what has happened uh, in a low middle income class country and how things can be addressed and how we can take out things and make a difference and grow in the future. Thank Thanks you. Thanks so much, Mervyn, that uh, excellent and very insightful comments. And we look forward to the, uh, um, to the video at the end. Uh, without further ado, Benedetta, on to, on to you and uh, your perspective, which I'm sure is quite uh, unique for us all in this experience. Thank you very much, Mike, uh, and uh, thanks everybody. It's amazing to hear uh, all these experiences, uh, and I, I, you're right. These experiences are quite different from mine, although I have to start by saying that uh, I'm an ID doctor, so I worked in the field and the clinical field for many years. My husband is uh, an ID doctor who has been at the front line in Italy since uh, February last year. So I've really lived uh, my role, which I'll explain in a second, but also his and, and my friend's experience as it was described earlier uh, by Matthew and others. So uh, I'm the uh, technical lead for infection prevention and control at WHOHQ. So uh, over the last uh, 15 months or so, um, I've been working very closely with a number of colleagues uh, in, um, in the health emergencies program. My program is actually the one which normally takes care of infection prevention and control in normal times. So. Uh, I'm in the Department of Health Systems, uh, but being uh, the lead for IPC in HQ, I've been immediately taken uh, into the, the field, actually. Uh, I did a mission to Italy uh, starting on the 25th of February last year when the 
epidemic had just started in Italy a few days uh, before, and uh, we, with my colleagues from the European office, uh, we were deployed to support the ministry at the very beginning. So um, I have to say, obviously, um, I think the the outcomes of my experience, even if uh, it's very different from yours, uh, are probably very similar to many things that have been said. So first of all, um, my work has been, as you know, uh, with other colleagues and many experts around the world to uh, assess the emerging evidence uh, in the field of epidemiology, IPC, uh, transmission and also clinical management um, and try to develop uh, emergency guidance. Uh, we have done this under, as you can imagine, different type of stress from many of you, but high, high pressure, high stress and uh, high speed um, and uh, only in the field of infection prevention and control in, uh, in about one year, we developed 14 uh, uh, guidance documents, uh, all of which have been updated at least once and some of them four of, or five times. So it has been really a lot of work, very challenging, assessing all the evidence coming through, um, in particular, as you all know, um, through the system that has developed in terms of um, non-peer-reviewed evidence that is publicly available, and therefore it is very challenging to assess its quality and, and therefore um, meaning in order to inform guidance development. So this has been extremely challenging, um, including, as you know, um, um, some criticism uh, um, against WHO's approach and, uh, and also different opinions and the difficulties in considering um, multiple uh, disciplines and uh, different opinions. So um, it is it, and it has been uh, extremely challenging, but also very rewarding in terms of, for instance, the incredible support that we gathered from uh, uh, hundreds of experts around the world uh, who since uh, more than one year has, have been with us every week. We have a group of experts only advising on IPC, which is 38 people uh, with, from many disciplines, from 25 countries, and they are with us every week. So we work together and we have felt extremely supported. Uh, one element that has been mentioned um, regarding health workers uh, is psychological bar burden, workload, uh, burnout, uh, anxiety, uh, depression. As you know, there are systematic reviews showing uh, that, uh, for instance, the level of anxiety and depression is uh, highly, uh, significantly higher than in other professional groups. Um, problems uh, with stigma and bullying. So all these aspects, um, I have to say, have been reflected also, in part, in my personal experience, in experience of other colleagues around me. So. I felt very sympathetic with um, many other colleagues around the world, in particular related to these aspects. Um, another consideration I would like to make, and this comes to the point of uh, considering what is the similarity with, the, with sepsis, there are many similarities, as you know, starting from the fact that <laughs> sepsis uh, is, uh, is a complication of infection and uh, is uh, the final common pathway to death uh, from many infectious diseases, including 
COVID-19. There are many similarities that others can point, but I want to point one in particular, which is that we all know that sepsis um, emerges when early diagnosis uh, is, is missing, and uh, this has a clear impact on fatality rates and on uh, uh, also uh, consequences, uh, longer term consequences of sepsis. So I think that at the very beginning in particular, uh, clearly COVID reflected these uh, aspects of inability to really detect early enough infections and therefore the evolution of complications, including uh, sepsis and sepsis shock in uh, uh, COVID patients. And, um, uh, and, and, and therefore the problem of not having in place the right triage systems, the, the right surveillance systems, the right uh, referral capacity uh, in low middle income countries, but it's amazing how this completely jeopardized uh, health systems also in high income countries. So I, th I think that this is an important point of similarity and this leads to uh, another point I have to say is the role of prevention then. Prevention and early diagnosis, which, was, which has been an issue. Preparedness, prevention, infection and prevention and control systems in place, which clearly have shown many flows, gaps uh, and effects in this pandemic both in the community and in particular in healthcare facilities. So uh, as you know, especially the high incidence of health workers infections uh, in the early uh, times of the pandemic uh, has clearly been due to lack of standard precautions, lack of uh, um, knowledge about really basic principles as other colleagues have uh, talked about uh, and uh, the lack of also um, understanding of how appropriately use uh, PPE um, and basic uh, uh, basic uh, practices such as uh, hand hygiene uh, um, and, as I said, correct use of PPE. Um, it is amazing also from uh, uh, the guidance development point of view, I think, um, at least in my experience, um, the fact that in this pandemic, we had to face issues of infection prevention and control, which normally I used to deal with in low middle income countries. I have experience in all the Ebola outbreaks of the last uh, five, six years. And only in those conditions, we were discussing about glove reuse or lack of PPE, uh, decontamination of PPE. And it was kind of, a, kind of a niche area for the research in my field, which never got traction, never got interest. And instead now we have global expert groups in all countries, including high income countries, working on research related, for instance, to the contamination of PPE, as it has been explained. So it's amazing how this has become a global reality, our tiny area where, as I said, I was, I felt throughout my work experience, like IPC as the Cinderella of many other um, areas. So I hope that this, uh, this, uh, this represents a sign of progress and that we will be able to continue research in these fields to for sure uh, help uh, come out of this pandemic, but also have a lot of new evidence helping, especially low resource settings in better dealing with any epidemic, which unfortunately they face very, very frequently every, every month or every year, as you know. So this is one of my conclusions. The second conclusion is the issue of staffing levels. I want to point out that 
in our guidelines, which we issued in 2015, based on uh, the lessons learned also from the West African Ebola outbreak. There is a strong recommendation for avoiding or preventing outbreaks, which really literally talks about staffing level as, as, as a key factor uh, determining uh, outbreaks and transmission of multidrug resistant germs. So WHO has a strong recommendation saying that health workers staffing level should be adequately assigned according to patient workload for the prevention of outbreaks. And for many other reasons, of course, for quality of care as a whole, but there, are, there is evidence in the direction I just explained. So I hope that our policymakers will reflect on this point in particular. Thank you so much, uh, uh, Benedetta. That's uh, so much uh, knowledge and insight to try and share there. And I'm sorry, it's such a short time we have. Uh, Ditesh, um, moving on to you now and to hear your experiences. I think, you know, it's, um, it's been really humbling to hear how, you know, countries, even the most uh, uh, well-resourced countries have, have faced and struggled during this. So it'd be interesting to hear how, how you've got on during this period. Yeah. Hi, everyone. Uh, thank you, Mike, for uh, inviting me to this meeting. And thank you, everyone, for sharing your experience. Uh, so I am uh, an intensive care physician. I work at a uh, tertiary level critical care unit in Kathmandu. That's the capital of Nepal. And uh, talking about our experience for Nepal, so, so early in the early months of uh, last year, like when the during the initial outbreak, uh, so one thing we started with was we went into lockdown quite early. So we had a quite strict lockdown in the first few months of the pandemic. So uh, we had some time, uh, you know, like uh, the problem was not that. Uh, that big, the number of patients were not that high. But, um, uh, you know, like uh, given the settings that we have, the resource limited settings, and, um, and, and given that we are not prepared for this kind of pandemic, so all of, all of the healthcare workers and, 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 uh, and the stakeholder, stakeholders were quite concerned and worried, like uh, we were not aware, like what's, what's there for us. So, uh, but the, the the real problem started only uh, after September October last year. So we had the a, a big wave of um, COVID patients during that time, and uh, in in setting like ours, where the access to healthcare facilities, like even access to basic healthcare facilities, are limited, and and being an ICU physician, so we uh, we. <clears throat> Uh, found that the, uh, we were struggling with the the critical care services that we were providing. The number of patients were um, were the, you know like um, especially the elderly ones. The, the number was really getting higher, and the mortality rate was quite high. So we really struggled uh, to manage uh, those COVID patients in the in that particular way. And the other, other experience that we had was related to the resource itself, like the access to uh, PPs was, uh, was a big problem for us. Like we are dependent upon our neighboring countries, China and India for all the medical supplies. And uh, uh, there was a, a big shortage of PPs. And at one time, the healthcare workers were wearing uh, locally improvised PP, you know, like the it was made of a material which is used for making brain coats. So it's so just imagine like uh, being in that PP for uh, long hours, like it was quite, uh, so it's quite a bad experience for all the healthcare workers, especially the nurses and the doctors, like who, who were within the COVID units for a long, long time. And um, and uh, that was a big issue. And uh, there are issues with the access to other life support equipment like ventilators, the access to you know, oxygen, like even most of the hospitals still, they do not have, um, they're still dependent upon uh, 
cylinder oxygen and uh, the and uh, it can be a big problem like if the number of cases go up like for now uh, we are in the early stage of the second wave uh, so you must all be aware of the situation in india and we share uh, an open border with india and the number of cases are going up right now so so and uh, and uh, i think that the problem is going to be big, bigger this time and um, and our healthcare facilities will be quite quite stressed and um, and um, uh, so and uh, the other thing is um, unlike last time where we had a very strict lockdown and um, which helped control the spread of the pandemic uh, the 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 social lifestyle and the and the and the public movements are still you know, like um, like they look normal in most of the part of the countries. So we are really worried that uh, this is there is going to be a, a big crisis in next uh, eight to twelve weeks at least. And uh, and uh, when we talk about the preparedness, so it comes down to the availability of vaccines and the rollout of the vaccines. So we are struggling with vaccinating our. And the people, not only the vulnerable, uh, even the vulnerable ones haven't received, like um, and the coverage of vaccination is quite low. So there are lots of issues and uh, regarding the current situation of COVID. So besides that, um, the other, other impact of COVID in our setting has been on the non-COVID services. Last year, uh, when the healthcare facilities were hit by the COVID, it had a huge impact on non-COVID services, especially uh, the uh, the healthcare, the health issues of the of pediatric populations, and um, um, especially the pregnant women. So the the maternal mortality rate was quite high during the pandemic, and I believe that it was the impact of the COVID on the non-COVID services. And people and, and some of those the critically ill patients really struggled getting admitted uh, for the emergency services as well. So that was a very very bad experience. And um, and the other thing that we have been uh, we have witnessed here is the association of COVID with sepsis. So I don't know whether it's because of the um, the high use of steroids or the immuno immunity related issues, but we have seen loss of secondary bacterial infections and in particular fungal infections, fungal pneumonia and multi-organ failure in COVID and post-COVID patients. So, so that's, a, that's a big, another big problem that we have struggled with. And uh, when we talk about the impact of COVID on healthcare workers, so, so the, the, there's a loss of psychological issues and, um, and um, the you know, like we already have a very limited number of healthcare workers, and even and the, and the trained ones, you know, like the ones who have uh, specialty training training in infectious disease or emergency services or critical care. The number of physicians and nurses are quite low, and we had to um, um, and we had to work with lots of. Uh, healthcare workers who didn't have much experience or no no experience at all of critical care services. So that's a that's a huge burden uh, for our healthcare facilities, and 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 some of the bad experience that the healthcare workers have faced here in during the initial days was the discrimination from even the societies like um, the. the there was an impression that the healthcare workers are the spreaders of the COVID. So some of the nurses that I work with, and they and they had to go through this discriminatory behavior uh, in their communities. So that was a bad experience. But over the months, it had changed. Now the people have become more aware, and uh, so we don't have that kind of situation right now. But the the, the workload and the mental health issues with the healthcare workers is uh, quite significant and um, and different protocols um, which have been implemented where there has been gap uh, in between the patients and the families you know like in the earlier earlier system the the families were uh, like they were 
involved in the care of the patients for this time because of the COVID, that there's a huge gap in, and uh, the families haven't been able to even uh, meet the, uh, the their loved ones in ICUs and the COVID wards. No matter, like we do try sometimes um, uh, to help them, but it's, it has it has it hasn't been an uh, easy job, you know. So loss of uh, uh, psychological issues for healthcare workers and the families as well. Yeah. Oh, sorry. Thank you, Natasha. Uh, yeah, it clearly has been a trying thank time you. there as it has been for so many of others that we've heard. Uh, I just want to make sure that we we move on to Cornelius now because we've been he's been a uh, hanging in there throughout. Uh, all of this and uh, hopefully your connectivity is uh, um, okay and I'll, I'll hand over to you now and we can hear, uh, um, hear your experience and then move on to the questions shortly after. All right. Um, thank you very much, Mike. Um, I, think, I think a couple of experiences that have been shared are similar to what uh, we experienced here in Uganda. Um, so, so Uganda is a is a pretty young country. We we literally have about about half of the population is under fifteen, and about maybe seventy eight percent of that population is under thirty. Uh, and and looking at the global uh, the, the global COVID nineteen uh, severity of illness, which was mostly in the elderly, when we compared that to our population, we had about uh, at least 10 percent of the population that was above 50 50 years um so in view of that we 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 one would say that would we would potentially be kind of confident that we wouldn't have much of that impact here but uh but i think at a certain point in time um we had our first our first case in uganda i think in march uh, somewhere towards the end of March, and then we went into an early lockdown similar to what Ditesh uh, had in Nepal, uh, and this lasted for about 60 days. Um, and during this lockdown, we used that as an opportunity for for us to to go through some drills in, in the ICU in how to manage COVID-19 patients uh, for the healthcare workers, both the nurses and the and the doctors would be potentially in the unit uh, and helping to run the 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 unit. Um, what I have to say is that during that time, uh, the, we had the the, the National Power Hospital had been undergoing some renovations, but was almost complete. And at the time, I think uh, we had uh, a, a capacity of about thirty bed ICU, uh, and probably the biggest in the country. Uh, however. There would be, of course, challenges with manning the unit um, uh, up to about 30 patients. So, so the, the designation was that all the patients who are COVID-19, critically ill or severely ill, would be coming to the National Referral Hospital. Um, and somewhere around July, we got the first ICU patient. Um, and similar to what Marvin said, uh, we 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 didn't we don't really we didn't really at the time uh, we didn't really have negative pressure, and so we had to open the windows and 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 uh, allow the air to flow in and and help us to eliminate the virus. But we with the PPE that we were putting on at the time was similar to what uh, people would put on for Ebola, and so it was pretty uncomfortable. Um, and then of course the the stigma the nurses experienced um, in, in, in the sense that they couldn't go back home. Uh, some of them spent a lot of months without uh, going home and seeing their families, and they had to stay around uh, within the hospital uh, just so they can continue their care. But um, during that time, I think I think uh, in terms of in terms of the uh, the staffing, we were. Uh, quite limited in in the in the number of doctors that we had. I think for about six doctors at at the start, uh, but the numbers eventually got bigger uh, with other doctors coming in. Um, and then of course we had about twenty ICU nurses um, who were split from the from another ICU within the within the within the the National Referral Hospital. So we had about two teams, and half of the team was managing the COVID-19 patients and the other half was managing the non-COVID-19 patients, um, which which was pretty difficult uh, because it meant a lot, a lot of more, a, a lot of work for the nurses and also for the doctors. 
um, it became it became quite challenging, um, especially in the months of November and uh, and December, when we had a, a very huge surge and and the wave was really massive for us. Um, the the mortality rate was pretty high, and I would get asked questions like. Why do we keep doing this? Um, what's the point of all this if the patients are going to die? And my response was always, uh, there's always that one patient that you can save and that means you have to keep going. Um, but, but it was pretty challenging during that time and over, over, over January and February we had a bit of a, of a wind down and there were less patients uh, in the ICU for us to deal with. Uh, we, we started to get a bit of a break, and and that kind of marked the end of the first wave. But uh, one of the things that I found challenging while I was in the ICU is that the patients that were being reported in other countries uh, in terms of age and them being old, uh, when it wasn't necessarily the same here. We had few, it, it, the median age was I think about fifty years, and we had so many young young patients coming in, and these were age mates of mine some of whom I actually knew and and it was difficult to to keep them uh, to keep them away from death because of so many challenges including them being so sick um, in terms of uh, I think you've all seen patients with covid-19 and their requirements for sedatives and and oxygen and it's really through the roof to the point that we we had to ask ourselves the question of whether we should even go ahead to intubate because we knew we just didn't have enough of some of the drugs that we needed at some point, uh, especially when the surge was at at its peak. Um, so it was it was uh, one of those challenges that that uh, we we don't really want to go back into now that the second the first wave is done, um, and I hope that maybe the vaccine can help us to 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 reduce the severity of disease. And, and and make sure that uh, a majority of patients don't end up in the ICU. So that is uh, that's that's been my experience. Um, I think the healthcare workers did a wonderful job here. Um, the nurses, I think, are the heartbeat of the ICU. Um, and without them, we couldn't have done much. Um, and I think I think the patients who went through the ICU and had the experience of getting out. Um, really did a lot in helping us to pass on the message to the communities um, and informing them of the challenges and the and the and the benefits of making sure that they obey the they follow the SOPs that were stipulated by the Ministry of Health. Um, and then and and I think one of the things that helped us to uh, to to go through this was was always getting together um uh, especially during uh, in, in we had the particular room where everyone would meet and and then and and before you go in you say a little prayer uh, and and you go in with the team that you're going in with so it was it was quite helpful that we were together in this um we had the whatsapp group where we did some bit of uh, sharing with each other in terms of the challenges in terms of the learning and and resources that we were getting from different places, um, so we had a bit of time um, before the before the we had the the first wave. However, in the in the during the months of of November and December, we also had the benefit of having more doctors coming in and more nurses coming in. Um, the other the the one thing that I would say was wonderful about. The sole experience is that it highlighted the need for critical care, um, and I personally believe critical care shouldn't be limited to the ICU walls. I think it should be spread out to the non-ICU areas, and this is where I think it's important for us to help other non-ICU healthcare workers to acquire some basic critical care skills um, and knowledge to be able to handle some of the patients and avert them from entering the ICU. Um, and I think that would go a long way, especially in low resource settings, in in uh, in, in reducing the need for ICU um, and ensuring that a majority of patients do make it out. Um, I think I think I'll submit back to you, Mike. All right, thanks so much, Cornelia, as well, everyone. That was so much to take in <laughs> and listen to uh, all those different stories. And there's certainly some themes that are coming out from across the different stories, the the challenges and stresses that everyone has been working under, but at the same time, this feeling of being never being needed more in your entire career, um, particularly some of us who 
have been in these um, forgotten careers of uh, sometimes feeling forgotten infection control or emergency preparedness where you're sort of, you know, when things are going right, you're never really noticed. Um, so that's been challenging that juxtaposition. Uh, the shortage of resources that people have faced, but then at the same time, how everyone was always looking for solutions and the innovation that was driven from it was quite remarkable. And then, of course, I think the most profound has been the human impact on both patients and providers, of course, uh, in all different uh, fields, whether you're um, you know, in any country and on, on any different type of role. I think the, one of the questions that I, I had I was going to come to with first was just back to Matt. And because being the, um, the the junior sort of colleague on this on this panel, you know, when you you just recently started your career three years ago, you said uh, neither you nor your colleagues ever anticipated you'd find yourself in the middle of a pandemic at this point. How do you think this experience has shaped your career and your colleagues' careers going forward? Definitely. I think none of us uh, beforehand, unless you had insight into the world of infectious diseases, uh, could have really, on a day-to-day -day basis, imagined that this would happen so quickly and, and that we'd all be launched into this situation. I think there's been impacts on myself and my colleagues, which could be negative and positive. So I think from a negative point of view, uh, that has been the mental health burden, as uh, lots of uh, my co-speakers have alluded to, of that hyper-acute cases, the trauma of seeing so much death uh, at such a young age, especially for myself, and the concern which, you know, I don't know right now what the effect that will be on me in future. So there's some research coming out saying that the rates of post-traumatic stress disorder is potentially around 10% in uh, critical and acute care, which is actually higher than what some of our British military have experienced after the wars that they fought in, in Iraq and Afghanistan. And sometimes when we're seeing these traumatic cases, especially for myself, it's always on the back of my mind, you know, is the thing I'm seeing now going to come back to jump out in my mind a year later, two years later, could this lead to uh, post-traumatic stress disorder, depression, anxiety, any of these things. But then on the positive, you know, we've learned that we can cope with things that we may never have realized we could cope with before. And from such a junior level, I've had experiences from a clinical perspective, which will stay with me for life. And I can probably look at a really sick patient now and feel far more confident than I would a year ago, because I've I've had that experience of dealing with so many and especially on a kind of mass casualty point of view, that experience may prove invaluable, touch wood if, if that ever happened in future. Uh, and I think, as others have said, the final thing would be the value in society that we now all feel. I, I think that, that confidence and, and that feeling like, you know, you found your place in the world and that you recognize your own value in the way that you can help someone at their most desperate time of need and that's something that I will if I never worked another day in my life I will always be proud of the time that I've spent over the last year being able to do that work. That's a you know, very fascinating and incredible insights Matt. Um, you were talking about coping skills and uh, you know, everyone in this call has, has, has managed to to you know, get to today after this difficult year so I was wondering if any of you had any other top tips number one sort of uh, coping strategy that you've used or that you've seen has worked for your colleagues that you wanted to, to share with the uh, with the group right. Cornelius you've come off uh, mute Did yeah you have, uh... yeah um, I think I think uh, one of my coping skill one of my coping tips was the serenity prayer um, may God give me the strength to change the things I can change and the wisdom to 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 and 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 uh, the wisdom to know the things I can't change. Um, so that was one of the prayers that uh, it actually did get modified at a certain point uh, on the on, on in the ICU by the ICU team uh, just to just for fun. But it was uh, one of those prayers that that you realize uh, because of the limitations you have. And the resources being so variable at, at different points in time, uh, you had to you had to realize that there are things that you can change and things that you can't change, and you need to know which is which. Um, and that kind of helped us to 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 push on. But at the end of the day, I think 
being together and having each other's back and talking through it with the rest of the colleagues did help a lot. Um, you cannot keep it to yourself. The, the, uh, personally, in my short practice in critical care, I had never seen so much ARDS, so much death um, within the ICU, and none of us had ever seen any of that. Uh, we are mostly used to trauma patients, um, uh, a couple of patients who are post-operative and, and some patients who are probably young but si- sick, young, but they can make it out and this was something else. The, the the age bracket was beyond what we expected, and the challenges were more than we expected. But I think it helped a lot with keeping together, talking through it, and we formed a WhatsApp group where we were all talking about um, our experiences, our our difficulties, and sharing with each other. So that that really did help help us a lot. Um, and Mike, if, if I can pick up on a, on a couple of points that Cornelius was saying, and I think that's exactly right, that bonding, that collegiality, that sharing amongst our own healthcare workers is invaluable in supporting each other because, you know, um, nobody else outside of the profession quite understands what we've gone through except each other. We've all supported each other through it, and I think it's really important that we continue to do that in the future. I'm I'm really rather concerned about the healthcare worker burnout rates and dropout rates of staff and staff that will walk away from this profession, you know, and I wanted to ask even Matt, you know, how do we enthuse the next generation of people and attract them to our profession given um, what we've all gone through? How, How do we continue to sustain healthcare workers and support each other as we all recover and to build our profession, particularly from the many healthcare workers that will probably walk away from this profession? So, so can, uh, for me, go ahead. Uh, so, so I, uh, I think it's a difficult question. How do we support healthcare workers? Uh, I think, firstly, we need to give healthcare workers the confidence that if they enter the profession or if they remain into the profession, they're going to be physically protected from death caused by infectious diseases. So, the number one mental health intervention is personal protective equipment. Uh, Then aside from that, we've obviously been shown to have this value and and that needs to be backed up by investment in healthcare services because that is, you know, the insurance policy for every country now and has been proven to be that. So I think, um, you know, showing healthcare workers that they are valued by investment in healthcare workers and in the healthcare services moving forwards, I think should help to retain people. Thanks, Matt. Um, Mervyn, I don't. Well, one just, second. Just, <laughs> Mervyn, I'll get to uh, Benedetta in a second. Mervyn, you were going to speak, but also I'm a. Uh, I'll let you answer that, and then I'll, I'll come to Benedetta. Thank, thank you very much, Mark. Um, I'm I'm one of the world's eternal optimists, and we've been through an enormously traumatic time. Confidence is enormously relevant. The profession is a privileged one. We choose to go out and help people every single day. We all have different mindsets. But one of the most important issues brings me back to one of the the early points I mentioned, and it was communication. We spoke every single day, twice daily. We allowed people to air their views. We supported them where it was. And not a single person, our unit, was ever expected to do anything without their hands being held and without team support. Because of that, they knew that they were backed and appreciated. And in fact, from a leadership perspective, if if we use analogies, good generals do the same things as their soldiers. You're in the trenches with them. That made an enormous difference. Uh, And being able to, to be there and do your very best is all that you can ever expect, irrespective of the circumstance that you're in. At the end of the day, We are facilitators with some degree of education that can impart to the best of our abilities whatever we believe would be in the best interests of patients. And as has been alluded to, sometimes things don't go favorably. Um, Communication is just so essential. It's essential in every single walk of life, and it brings resilience. And remember, an attitude that you take out there is altitude. 
You go out with a positive attitude and where things do go awry, you get down, you speak about it, you move through it, you reevaluate, you reassess, and you see how you can feasibly do better next time. And it's very important working and living in a sunny country. It doesn't matter what the weather is. You take your sun with you. That brings warmth and sometimes a degree of wisdom and sometimes it changes outcome. And so I think it's really, really important. And I'd had down amongst the points there, one of the entities that as a very positive South African, I grew up in a country where I had the, the privilege of being exposed to perhaps one of the greatest leaders um, who when history is written may go down as the greatest leader who ever did live, that was Nelson Mandela. And he, in fact, shared sentiments that allowed us to recognize the hurdles, the obstacles, the challenges, the burdens, the enormity of problems that he faced with a degree that could resonate with all of us. And perhaps I want to finish off this particular aspect of things with, with one of the many quotes of wisdom that resonated with me immensely. And it goes something as follows. It's in your hands to make this world a better place for all who live in it. And surely that is what our job is to do. And you can be reassured through the darkest moment, the sun and the light will come up the following day. And even if there's just a glimmer of light, that brings hope. And if you've got hope, you can move forward. So with those words, I'm going to hand back to you, Mike. Uh, that's uh, very powerful. I'm uh, des- writing down all the quotes um, from you today. I remember being poor doesn't mean poor care, and you and you carry the sun with you are definitely two that I'm taking home. Um, Benedette, did you want to comment on that, or did you have something else you wanted to bring the discussion towards? So um, very difficult to add anything to everything has been said, in particular Marvin, and uh, I have to say I'm a uh, I'm um, a very passionate follower of Nelson Mandela, and I often conclude my presentations with his quotes. So uh, thank you, Marvin. Um, No, so then given these inspirational words, I I take uh, the risk of going back to boring (laughs) topics by... um, really highlighting uh, uh, and going back to Matt's uh, words about uh, protecting health workers uh, and giving them PPE. I would say prevention is more than this. And I I really call for real functional uh, infection prevention and control programs, which means really implementation. It means involvement of health workers, better knowledge, which is not easily gained. It's not about, you know, making a presentation. It's about senior colleagues engaging in mentorship. Uh, It's about bedside training and education. It's direct involvement of health workers in quality of care delivery. So it's it's many additional things, really, uh, not only PPE, because the point that this pandemic has really highlighted, one of the points is that you can have all the PPEs, but if you are unprepared to use them appropriately, if you don't understand that it's not about, you know, the level of uh, of protection at a certain extent, of course, you need the right protections. I fully agree, but you can have all PPEs and if you don't learn how to use them appropriately, you will get infected the same way as almost not having them. So these are really important concepts. And this is also good news because I think, you know, going back to the basics and learning the basics, learning risk assessment and how to, you know, re- rationally use PPEs, for instance, uh, really contributes to risk prevention and also to avoid wasting 
there has been an, an enormous additional problem of waste management, for instance, in this pandemic. So uh, it's a complex issue, a complex discipline, but uh, the answers are there. There are guidelines and especially there are implementation approaches and there are country and local experiences that, that are extremely successful even with low level of resources. So uh, this is my call really to look at IPC in a comprehensive way, a multidisciplinary way. It's everybody's business. It's not only IPC professionals. Uh, and each one of us um, has his or her own uh, role in this. Thank you. Uh, I've definitely hit the, the nail on the head, Benedetta, and uh, a mantra that I've uh, advocated for a long time, both around infection control, but also uh, emergency preparedness. And as Marvin said, doing the simple things well is critical, but this comes down to leadership. It comes down to culture and organizations. It comes down to how we, how we operate. And if you can't, you can't manage these things on a day-to-day -day basis, you're never going to be able to manage in a crisis. And I think, if anything, this just uh, highlights the day-to-day -day challenges that we faced and, and not um, not bringing these things into the forefront of our practices on a daily basis. Uh, there was a, um, a question that came that uh, there's been a few questions or comments around staffing, so I thought I'd just quickly um, put that out to see if people had any thoughts around uh, addressing the staffing and then we'll um, we'll move on to one last question before we move to, uh, to Mervyn's uh, uh, closing for this. So did anybody have any particular thoughts about what well, you've seen that's been successful around addressing staffing issues and um, and uh, either locally or in, or elsewhere? Well, so I was one of those workforces that were um, upskilled or, or reskilled, so to speak, um, in preparedness to to come back to to an intensive care bedside um, in preparation for further surges, but. And we, we had a number of uh, other nurses like myself that were coming back into areas that either you've um, had previous skill sets in intensive care and, and you've been pulled back into that space or, or new people being exposed to that space. But I think um, you can be as prepared as you possibly think you can, but when your entire hospital system and network is completely overwhelmed, um, it puts a stretch and a strain on every aspect of your, your healthcare system. You know, that's um, from your cleaning staff to your kitchen staff to your administrator staff. Um, it puts an, an immense strain I remember chatting to colleagues, um, even in other areas of Australia, saying, surely you all learnt something from the first wave. Uh, and you're like, well, yes, we did. Um, but when you're still faced with it, and, and, and at one stage we had a very disproportionate response. So whilst my hospitals were completely overrun and overwhelmed, there were other hospitals like 10 kilometres away that had absolutely no COVID patients. They had empty intensive care units um, they they'd stripped their hospitals of elective surgery and so their hospitals were sitting waiting to receive, you know, patients that, that never came. There was a very disproportionate response to it. Um, we often work in silos in healthcare institutions. We have different electronic medical record systems, different paper charting systems, but to, to have the ability to manoeuvre and, and manipulate and move stuff from other centres where they're, they're not being as well utilised, um, I think is something that we could do better at in the future um, in redeploying and, and creating that skill set. We did have staff members coming from um, uh, other states um, to the state of Victoria to help out. Um, there's certainly a lot of goodwill and there are certainly a lot of people that are prepared to come and help, help their colleagues. Um, it's about how you logistically coordinate that and, and use it to its best advantage. Thanks, Mervyn. Did you have something you wanted to say? And then, uh, I, I, and then we can I, pass on to our closing, I think. No, thank, thank you, Mike. I'd absolutely concur. I think wherever one was, um, preparation was really essential. Didn't matter what your resources were. Um, and, you know, preparing adequately, even if you don't have skilled uh, individuals, you can create that. Uh, we were able to, as I mentioned earlier on, um, expand our capacity dramatically. Uh, we actually had got very basic staff nurses. Uh, in fact, some were even cleaners that were converted into nurses who then subsequently uh, were, were trained um, 
uh, with the essentials and on the job and are doing a superb job at the present moment. And what it means is that moving into the future, we will retain these staff. We did that with basic medical officers in where we uh, appealed to the authorities to create so-called COVID posts, and we employed unemployed doctors, believe it or not, in a resource-limited setting, and many of them today have, are, are really excellent intensivists. And so it's about how you go about these processes, and it's across the board. It's not just about doctors and nurses. It's about seeing that porters and cleaners were fine, and that you cycle them around to ensure that that burnout that we alluded to doesn't happen, and that you thank them and that you commend them for this wonderful work. And when that starts happening, you get a team together that really does work and that does make um, that difference uh, in the lives, hopefully, of, of several people. And so I think there is a way forward. Uh, it's about how we, we generally go about it. Thanks, Mervyn. And it's uh, it's been wonderful to chat with all of you. I have so many questions I'd love to still ask you, and uh, um, and I'm sure others would like to hear, but uh, Matthew, Samantha, Tesh, uh, Benedette, Cornelius, uh, thank you so much for um, for your time today on behalf of both the, uh, the organizers as well as the audience. And uh, I'm going to just, um, I think there's going to be a few slides that are going to play at the end just after we close, but to remind people to uh, um, thank the, to uh, go on YouTube for um, the ability to watch this and the other sessions, as well as to thank all of our sponsors. But now I'm going to pass over to Mervyn, and I think um, the uh, staff behind the scenes are going to bring up a, uh, um, a video to play, and hopefully we'll all be able to. Uh, hear it and see it. Well, thank you very much, Mike, and to, to all the wonderful colleagues. And once again, to all our fabulous colleagues around the world who've done a, an absolutely fantastic job. And we, we extend our friendship and our warmth to, to everyone. One of the things that struck me during this time was that we've all been and had to be so focused on dealing with something that we've never had to deal with previously. And each late night that I left my hospital adjacent to my hospital is a school. And that school was closed and I had to um, pass that school every day and it struck me about how impactful this really was because the future is about young people. And if we had to close schools, education doesn't happen and education ultimately is the future. And every morning when I entered, the same school was still closed. And we're all human at the end of the day. And what we've been chatting about throughout this whole day with this wonderful conference is, is about the human element and how we can improve things and how we can actually improve and take in the elements that life has to offer, because that's what we've all been trying to do. And I think it's what we've all been trying to say. And so this school, in fact, put together their choir and uh, a song that will resonate with all of you uh, that sends me to a different place every time I, I listen to it and see it um, and reminds me why I work where I do in a resource-limited setting and why I work on the continent that I do. But it will resonate with everyone because everyone who's listening to this and certainly every one of the panelists would be familiar with this particular song. Uh, so I'd like to wish you all well. Let's hope that at a point in time, we can all rejoice uh, in the joy of life, which is what this is all about. And I'd like to really say a very gracious thank you to everyone. Mike, to you, I'll pass back to you to, to close, but a very gracious thanks for the, for the kind invitation and um, the ability and, and want to, to just share issues, which allows us all to, to grow moving forward. So please enjoy this, listen for as long as you want, and I'm sure it'll, you'll find this touching. Thanks, Pervin. I think we'll just let the music uh, um, close for us. secret chord that David played and it pleased the Lord but you don't really 